Hey everybody, happy Thursday. Today's date is May 7th, um, it's 10.30 a.m. I'm gonna be posting a very, uh, hopefully a shorter lecture for you guys today um, with some discussion questions, and that will be due tomorrow on Friday. All right, a couple of things before we begin. I posted some things on the wall stream, some information. As always, if you have any questions about anything regarding grades, next year's schedule, college, recommendations, whatever it may be, don't hesitate to send me either an email through uh, jpujol2 at schools.nyc.gov, as you guys well know, or you can post the question. If it's not something that you wanna keep uh, private, you can post it on the wall stream and I'll answer it right there because, and that's a good thing to do because sometimes other people have questions as well um, that might be similar and that way we can kind of answer everybody, okay? Uh, a couple of things before we begin our discussion on this very controversial uh, encounter with Mr. Antolini that Holden has. It's one of the most talked about moments in The Catcher in the Rye. Um, first things first about grades. Um, I was very kind. If you'll notice, I did not include any zeros for missing work. I understand that a lot of you have personal situations. Um, however, if you didn't do any work for the marking period, despite whatever your average might have been, I still gave you an NX, which means that you don't get any credit, okay? Because what I didn't wanna do was give you guys zeros, have that destroy your average without knowing what's happening personally in your situation at home. So the DOE as well kind of created this kind of policy and I'm gonna continue it or we're gonna to adhere to it in class. And the NX just simply says that you didn't fulfill the work for the marking period and that you will at a later date, okay? Again, you don't want to have too many of this or too much work piling up, especially if we this goes into the summer or it carries on into next year. What you want to do is do the work, get it over with, do as best as you can, all right? Uh, and for those of you who got your grades this morning, you know very well that um, I was not only lenient, but I did reward many of you who have been staying consistent and doing the work and being active on the post. I'm always so super impressed with so many of you and your desire to kind of want to discuss a little further and your insight. And I do read word for word everything you uh, submit. And I'm always so pleasantly surprised and impressed by the quality of your work. So keep that up, okay? Um, moving forward, if you heard last night or this morning, Zoom, which is um, a very kind of versatile, uh, easy to use app, um, has now been approved again by the DOE. My original thing was to get us on Google Meets, but I've heard some horror stories and even me trying to play around with Google Meets is it isn't as fluid as Zoom is. All right. So what we're going to do sometime next week is we're going to have a Zoom meeting where we're going to kind of I'm going to field questions about the ending of Catcher in the Rye. We're going to have a nice summation or summary, better said, of um, what happens towards the end of the novel. What are the, some of the more uh, important themes that Salinger presents and the literary techniques that he uses throughout the novel will kind of touch base on how everything works towards presenting these um, moral lessons uh, that I think one of the things why Catcher has such a great impact on a lot of readers is because the lessons are these kind of universal, timeless messages about humanity and existence and change and growing up. And I think it's a beautiful moment. So I want to share that with you guys in a Zoom discussion. Details to follow. Okay. All right. So let's get into the chapter. I don't want to make this lecture too long for you guys. Um, please make sure that you answer the questions provided uh, with the discussion on the classwork tab. Or And please make sure that they're submitted at the latest, all right, by Monday of next week. Okay. So um, first things first, what I want to touch base on, all right, is a little, let me just get this started here. Okay. Before we move on to Mr. Antolini, a lot of um, other very important things happen, which kind of reflect a lot of the conversations we've had. So I just kind of want to go over them. All right. The beginning of chapter four picks up again, right? With this meeting that Holden has with Phoebe. Remember that Phoebe's name has symbolic significance. It represents light or brightness. And she is definitely, there's a reason why the ending of the novel happens very closely after, or very soon after Holden meets Phoebe. She does represent a catalyst, right? A uh, catalyst is something, for those of you who uh, have taken chemistry, that kind of speeds up a reaction, speeds up a change. And in many ways, uh, we'll come to see by the end of the novel that Phoebe is really the one that saves Holden's life in many ways, all right? And again, her name representing light, the symbol that we've discussed so much this year and appears so much throughout all world literature, throughout all of human history as something positive, 
representing knowledge, enlightenment, information. Okay. Um, so before we get into our discussion of Mr. Antolini, let's pick it up a little bit with this moment. Okay. Come on, I said. You feel like dancing? I taught her how to dance and all when she was a tiny little kid. She's a very good dancer. I mean, I just taught her a few things. She learned it mostly by herself. You can't teach somebody how to really dance. You have shoes on, she said. I'll take them off. Come on. She practically jumped off the bed, and then she waited while I took my shoes off, and then I danced with her a while. Now, this is among one of the many beautiful moments that Holden shares with his kid sister, Phoebe. All right, we talked a lot about Holden's desire to kind of want to remain childish. We talked a lot about the psychology of Holden, the complexes that he seems to exhibit, things like the protector complex, the Peter Pan complex. This is um, shortly after he shares with Phoebe the catcher fantasy, which reveals this kind of messianic complex that we discussed, right? Holden's desire to want to save people, to sacrifice himself at the edge of the cliff, right? But to save the children falling off from entering the evils and the perils and the danger of adulthood, all right? And we discuss whether that's a noble thing as misguided and as quote unquote crazy, right? Um, as his vision is, we talked about it being something very positive in Holden to want to help others, right? And moments later, you know, Holden very much longs for moments when he, um, gets to act childish. And here he shares a moment with Phoebe, you know, when you're a kid, you love to dance and you kind of dance. And one of the things that we discussed a lot that we kind of lose as we get older is not just our imagination, but our willingness sometimes to be silly. You know, when you're a kid and you're, you want to be silly, you're silly and you don't care who's watching, right? And you dance on the bed and you jump and, and then suddenly around, like we discussed a later age, eight, nine, 10, 11, whenever, um, Personally, everybody develops differently. You start to grow like self-conscious and all of a sudden you become aware of your clothing. You become aware of other people's opinions, right? And maybe this kind of safeguards you a little bit. So Holden shares this beautiful moment here with his kid sister, Phoebe. And I think it demonstrates in many ways Holden's desire for this kind of carefree childish world. And I love this moment with her, right? And Phoebe's incredibly bright. She says something to Holden at one point, which um, really falls into the larger format of the novel, right? She tells him that she's been practicing raising her temperature with her mind, right? And if we were in class together, I'd share with you a funny story about one time uh, when I tried to feign or fake, uh, feign is another word for fake, uh, sickness in order to get out of school when I was a kid and I took the thermometer, I put it by the light bulb and my mother had to rush me through the hospital because my temperature was like 115 or 20 degrees, which is obviously not really possible. You'd be dead by then, right? Um, but if any of you have ever faked being sick in order to get out of school, <clears throat> which I hope many of you haven't, but I'm sure some of you have, you know that oftentimes, right, when you fake something, you actually start to feel it. So if you fake a stomach ache, oh, mom, I don't want to go to school. Mom says, okay, you convince her, she leaves the house. Next thing you know, you're home and you're like, oh my God, my stomach's starting to hurt. And I think what Phoebe's touching on here is the power of the mind over the things that are physical, Right. Um, the power that we have, I mean, she does it in a very kind of immature 10 year old way, although she's onto something here, especially when it pertains to Holden, right? The power we have in our mind to control the way we feel, right? To control even, uh, things like pain or things like, um, you know, one of the interesting things you've seen, um, a lot of these Buddhist monks have this capability of entering these deep meditative stances and not even feeling like any physical pain. Um, and it's been scientifically proven that the mind can control the body. And what better moment uh, that Salinger has, his pro troubled, depressed, soon to have a mental breakdown protagonist, have a conversation with his kid sister about how all you have to do is go into your mind and it helps you control the body. This is very much a novel about psychology written by a man with deep seated trauma from uh, some, a couple of things that might've happened to him in his past, most likely, obviously the biggest one being his experience in World War II. Um, but I think it's one of the more hit, remember always that literature contains large themes, which we'll discuss a lot next week during our Zoom meeting, when we encapsulate everything that Catcher in the Rye um, seeks to share with us. And then, you know, there's smaller themes that appear on each page. And here's a little one, right? And not to use a cliche, we always have to avoid cliches when discussing themes, but the power of the mind really, mind over matter in many ways, right? Um, and then towards the end of this chapter, things turn very tragic and sad and Holden shares this terrible, um, he starts to cry 
in front of her and really shows you once again Holden's weaker mental state. And I think he starts to cry because he he has to ask his 10-year-old sister to borrow money. One of the things we discussed in the last lecture is how there seems to be a role reversal here, right? Um, and instead here, Holden starts to cry. I mean, imagine uh, being 10 years old and watching your 16-year-old or 15-year-old brother crying. Um, it's very jarring for Phoebe here. And I think he starts to cry because he realizes how pathetic in many ways his situation is, right? That he um, he's had to rely on his 10-year-old kid sister. Remember, this is a boy with a deep-seated protector complex, also the messianic complex, his desire to protect others, to save others. And here he's begging for money or asking for money from his kid sister. And this moment definitely represents a turning point in Holden's journey because he, he relinquishes, he gives up this very important item, which represents his indiv individuality, his desire to be a nonconformist, and that's his red hunting hat. Right? And he gives it to his kid sister, Phoebe. And this very much represents the beginning of the end of the narrative. Right, This is representing, remember always, that main characters, protagonists, in order to be a protagonist, must have a goal. Right, They can be morally ambiguous. Um, and another one defining moment of a protagonist is that they must endure some sort or um, experience some sort of change, dramatic change. Right, The journey of the protagonist, the experience, is what a narrative is about. Uh, and this change is called an epiphany, which we'll discuss uh, again next week as we encounter Holden's epiphany in the very last chapter. Um, but this is the moment that sparks this change for Holden. You know, he's giving up this very prized possession. Um, this encounter with Phoebe really sparks a change, and that's why she's considered by many ways to be a catalyst. Um, all right, so let's move on to Mr. Antolini. Mr. Antolini is first mentioned at the beginning of Chapter 23, so we're just going to pick it up there, okay? Okay. Um, he was about the best teacher I ever had, Mr. Antolini. He was a pretty young guy, not much older than my brother DB, and you could kid around with him without losing your respect for him. He was the one that finally picked up that boy that jumped out the window I told you about, James Castle. Old Mr. Antolini felt his pulse and all, and then he took off his coat and put it over James Castle and carried him all the way to the infirmary. He didn't give a, he didn't even give a damn if his coat got all bloody. So Mr. Antolini for Holden represents, he's a family friend. He, if you'll notice anything, Holden loves to read and write. Not, you know, me as an English teacher saying, oh, props to English, but Holden very much loves literature, right? So it makes sense that he would get along with an English teacher here. Um, Antolini seems to be a cool guy. They can joke around. Um, obviously, uh, Holden admires him in many ways. And he, look at the moment that he picks out to introduce Mr. Antolini. Mr. Antolini represents a character. Remember that. With the character of James Castle is introduced not only like we discussed in the last lecture, the motif of falling, but also really a character that represents the law, the dramatic loss of innocence to a world that Holden views as cruel and phony and in this case, really murderous in some ways. Right. Um, and look at Mr. Antolini. He remembers him at this moment, this uh, altruistic, empathetic person who sees this dead body and covers it because he wants to give him some sort of, uh, or de deny, give the body a sort of respect, right? So that other people wouldn't see the condition it's in. And this says a lot, I think, about Mr. Antolini as a person, right? That he's willing to forego his own property in order to respect, or um, maybe respect is not the right word, but to, to not allow the shame or the embarrassment of seeing the body in the way it is, right? Um, and this is what sticks out to Holden. Um, now, Let's get into the case itself, all right? Um, you know, we'll discuss a lot in a couple of minutes about why this moment is so controversial and whether or not I think Salinger intended it this way, but let's stick to the case, all right? A lot of you, and in my experiences that most students in the past also find this moment to be quite alarming, right? Especially at the end of the chapter, and that there is something kind of wrong here in some ways, okay? So let's talk a little bit about what a lot of, a lot of you chose to prosecute Mr. Antolini to find him guilty of some sort of uh, child negligence or um, really just inappropriate activity, whether it's sexual or endangering of a child. The charges would be um, somewhere along those lines, right? So Holden picks up a lot of a uh, you know I'm, I'm going to try to play devil's advocate here and present both sides of the case uh, because I think that literature, like we've always discussed this year, really is up for interpretation, right? 
So there is a lot of evidence that a lot of you brought up, right? One of the things is that um, Holden starts to notice a lot of details. First of all, he shows up to the apartment kind of unannounced, right? Mr. Antolini and Miss Antolini had just had a dinner party. It's very obvious that they've had alcohol, right? Um, alcohol is present in the scene, which kind of skews or kind of um, throws us for a loop because alcohol, and we've discussed when we read that poem, uh, My Papa's Waltz, and we discuss with Holden and why adolescents love or long sometimes to want to consume alcohol, right? Um, alcohol kind of uh, creates in people perhaps this in um, the inability, let's say, to properly act according to the way you normally would, right? It lowers that, what we discuss as your inhibitions here. Uh, next year, when you guys read The Great Gatsby, which is a commentary on the 1920s America where people were drinking a lot. Alcohol is in almost every scene, and it's going to be a major part of your conversation next year, junior year. And whenever alcohol is in a scene, it kind of throws a lot of things around, right? So the first thing against Mr. Antolini is that he is in, um, he's not sober, and he is around a child. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing would be this little things that Holden picks up, right? He picks up that Mr. Antolini seems to be married to a woman who's much older. He seems to have been married for money. He seems to um, publicly be very kind of affectionate, as though he's putting on a show for people uh, with his wife. But yet behind closed doors, they sleep in different beds and uh, they're not affectionate at all. Holden also comments that Mr. Antolini's wife isn't necessarily the most beautiful or attractive person. All right. And a lot of you wrote this as the evidence for charges against Mr. Antolini. He does uh, kind of not force Holden to stay, but he kind of speaks forcefully to hold in to stay. He gives them clothes to wear. He follows them to the door. And obviously the um, inappropriate moment that most people um, discuss as inappropriate is obviously when hold, when Mr. Antolini goes to touch Holden's head, right? He seems to be petting him in some way. Um, and Holden kind of gets bugged out by this and he feels very kind of um, uh, not right with all this and that's the moment that he decides to kind of like leave the apartment right um so there are a lot of charges for uh, against mr antolini one of the things that i want to kind of remark on right because i saw it on a lot of your writing which is what something that we have to kind of discuss and I, again if we were in class these would make for a great discussions even like maybe even two days right a lot of you wrote well if holden perceives the behavior as incorrect then it has to be incorrect right um you have to be very careful, right? One of the things, remember what we always discussed in class, that nothing's ever one. Yeah, there are things that 100% absolutely right and hundred like some things that are absolutely 100% wrong, things like murder, for example, right? But there's always that gray area in between. Um, there's always that interpretation. There's always that, um, that kind of, you know, you, you have to always look at things from different perspectives, right? Um, if somebody says something in an innocent way and someone else perceives it as in a, kind of hostile way, who's right there, right? If we walked around judging everybody constantly by the way we we perceived actions and comments, yes, yeah, some actions and some comments are, uh, deserve to be attacked and reprimanded by us and pushed away, right, and avoided as wrong. I'm not going to take that away. But um, if everything we perceive to be, we live in a society that's kind of like ultra sensitive about a lot of things, right? So um, be be weary of that. That's all I'm just going to say because I saw it a lot in your writing that sometimes, you know, guilt isn't just in the perception of the person who sometimes feels, right, that something's been done wrong because you have to always look at intent as well as perception. And the intent of Mr. Antolini is what should have also came into question, right? Um, so there's a lot of evidence for to Mr. Antolini's guilt, right? And a lot of you did a very good job. I was very impressed. A lot of you did a great textual evidence. You great got some great quotes. Um, and you kind of, in many ways, remember always that when it comes to law and things like that, it's how you paint, it's how you perceive the facts, right? And a lot of you did a very good job of painting Mr. Antolini as not having Holden's best interest in mind and perhaps conducting himself in a way that was completely inappropriate, okay? All right, so let's move on to the defense. Some of you chose to defend Mr. Antolini and some of you did a very good and very passionate job of this. So first things first, right? Let's look at the context of the situation. Um, a lot of the evidence that Holden presents against Mr. Antolini, keep in mind that Holden is an unreliable narrator, right? Um, again, not 
bringing to light the fact also that that literature has so many themes, right? The value of good literature is, is the multitude of great lessons that it has. And here's a lesson on perception, maybe, and also how the criticisms that we impart on others are sometimes not the same criticisms that we apply to ourselves, right? Uh, many of you have heard a lot of these cliche statements, like uh, some people don't follow their own advice, right? Um, or people that live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones, right? And look at Holden. This is a boy who's a nonconformist who hates being judged. And yet look what he does with Mr. Antolini here. He judges him. He judges him that he's married a woman that is not as beautiful as she should be or not his same age. She judges, um, he judges Mr. Antolini, um, the amount of affection that he has with his wife, right? And I think that one of the things that we need to, my dog's barking up there. I hope um, you guys don't hear that. Um, maybe she's testifying for Mr. Antolini. I don't know. Uh, Lola, shut up. So, um, where was I? All right. So once again, one of the lessons here could be about perception, right? And like, look at Holden. He's so unwilling to kind of accept other people's criticism and not conform to society. And then look at Mr. Antolini. This is a man who's, you can tell, is kind of a nonconformist. You know, he kind of um, is a little bit of, a, I don't want to say a radical, but he, you know, he isn't necessarily fit the stereotype of, of like, he's not Mr. Spencer, let's say, right? He's not kind of like... Um, this more traditional teacher. He's younger. He's um, he, the advice that he imparts to Holden has a lot of kind of. Well, we'll talk about the advice in a minute, but let's just talk about the the charges so far. So a lot of the evidence is circumstantial, right? The idea that Mr. Antolini married an older woman, that the, perhaps it's all a show that marriage, that he married for money, all that stuff. A lot of this is just Holden being judgmental in many ways, as you can say, um, many of you sensed. And then there's obviously the moment where Holden goes to sleep and he wakes up in Mr. Antolini's couch and Mr. Antolini is sitting there petting Holden's head. Okay. Now, if Mr. Antolini's intentions are, are to do harm, then this is a terrible moment because at his most fragile state, Holden is yet again encountering a moment where instead of getting something positive, think of all the failed connections that Holden's had. He's had so many failed connections with everybody. All he, all this boy needs is love. He needs company. He needs good guidance. And here, he's yet again, he's he's kind of thrown into a situation that doesn't end well for him. Um, but the moment where Mr. Antolini is touching Holden, that Holden conceives as inappropriate, ready? If you're looking at the evidence as a defense of Mr. Antolini, maybe what Mr. Antolini is giving Holden here is simply what, what Holden needs which is a little bit of love. You know, we live in a society nowadays that's very hypersensitive, uh, especially among men, right? We live, like we discussed this in class as well, we applied a lot of gender theory and gender criticism. And we discussed a lot how there are certain aspects of American society that are very homophobic. And that's today in 2020. What do you think it was like in 1950, right? Remember that the agenda of Salinger as a writer was to bring to light a lot of things that were wrong with American society. Right. And one of the things that's a major criticism, according to a lot of sociologists about our society, is that emotional connection among men. Right. Not sexual, not intimate. Right. Let's not let's not go down that route. But that an emotional connection among men is something that is kind of frowned upon. Right. You're not a, not really allowed to be emotional or show concern. Society today's time doesn't really promote an emotional response from men, especially towards other men. Right. Uh, men are more, according to a lot of statistics and studies, men are least likely to share their feelings with people, for example. Right. So maybe what Mr. Antolini here is giving Holden isn't like this kind of sexual advance, but instead he's doing it in a much more fatherly way. Right. Um, you can tell that Holden doesn't have a good relationship with his father. Maybe that's what he's missing in some ways. Right. And Mr. Antolini recognizes that he's he's a family friend. And what he does here is he. He's giving, he's petting Holden on the head the same way a parent would, right? Not in a misguided sexual way, but in a kind of wanting to comfort and care for someone kind of way. He's, a, he's admiring, Holden said that he was admiring him. And that word admire is an interesting choice, right? It's an interesting diction or choice of verb or word by um, Salinger. Because when you admire something, you, you, 
you admire it. And I don't think Antolini is admiring here Holden in a sexual sense. He's admiring Holden for his rebelliousness, for his nonconformity, for his altruism, for his, um, because he knows Holden personally, right? And he just maybe cares for him. And maybe what Holden gets here is finally what he's looking for. And instead of embracing it and maybe getting up and crying to Mr. Antolini and telling him what's wrong and maybe getting a hug or, right? All of a sudden, Holden reacts in a very Holden-esque way and decides to kind of um, leave the apartment, right? So there's a lot of ways that the defense uh, could have um, defended Mr. Antolini. And again, just like the trial we had for Lord of the Flies, I wish we had done this in class. It would have been a great trial. This one usually lasts a couple of days. Um, but um, this is a very much an abridged version. Um, but again, it's all about how you present the evidence, right? I love these two moments, both in Lord of the Flies and Catch in the Rye, because it's really all about the team and how they present the facts of whether or not uh, proves the, the guilt or the, or the non-guilt of Mr. Antolini in this case. Now, let's talk a little bit about the verdict here, all right? Um, I'm not going to go into which class won who or who presented the better um, case, but let's talk a little bit about always, you have to always look at author's intention. How does this work, right? What did Salinger want to accomplish? So if Mr. Antolini is guilty of something, right? If Mr. Antolini is, in essence, a sexual predator at this moment, right? Let's look at this question. How about Mr. Antolini acting immorally with Holden work within the context of the narrative, right? Whenever you have a controversial moment in literature, and you should know this very well for many of you, uh, reading comprehension, always ask yourself, like, what's the author's intention? What Would it work in the novel one way or would it work in the novel the other way, right? And I think that one of the cool things about this moment is that it works both ways, right? The first one is, how might Mr. Antolini acting immorally with Holden work? Work. Well, Holden is a young boy who's witnessed a lot of very terrible things in his life, right? The death of his younger brother, the suicide of a boy uh, because he was abused by others. Um, the boys who judge him because of his wealth, uh, because of his religion. He's witnessed prejudice, phoniness of the adult world, right? So if Mr. Antolini is a horrible adult, then this furthers the context of the narrative because it's yet another example of Holden encountering something that is terrible within the adult world, right? And I can't think of anything more terrible, right, uh, in terms of human behavior than uh, rape or sexual kind of molestation like it is here, right? So within the context of the narrative, Mr. Antolini as being this trusted family friend that Holden admires for many reasons, right, um, kind of betraying the act of this, yet another betrayal by the adult world. All right. So in that sense, Mr. Antolini's guilt does further the narrative, right? As uh, yet again, Holden, an not another failed connection, another betrayal, another perfect proof that the adult world and that society is corrupt and disgusting and all the things that Holden thinks. But then let's look at the other angle, right? How might Holden misconstruing or misinterpreting or not really seeing what's happening here work within the context? If Mr. Antolini is innocent, right? and Holden misconstrues this, that also works within the context of the narrative. Because what happens here is it's Holden yet again, right? Having a failed connection, not because of someone else's fault, but because of his own personal qualities, right? He has a misconnection with Miss Morrow. Why? Because he lies to her, right? He has a misconnection with um, Sally Hayes, why? Because he's acting immature at the moment. Same thing with Carl Luce, right? Same thing with Lillian Simmons, right? Because he judges her based on how phony she is. And there's yet another minor theme there, right? That sometimes our interactions with others and what we blame as failed connections isn't necessarily the fault of someone else that we have to be introspective and look within, right? So within the context of the narrative there, it fits both ways, right? In one way, it fits that this is yet a more further proof that the adult world is corrupt. And in the other way, it's really the focus is more on Holden, right? And how Holden's having a tough time of life, not because so much because of the society around him, but because of the inner demons that he has, right? Now, there's a lot of to show here, for example, that what happened with Mr. Antolini was in fact misconstrued right? If you look at the smaller details, some of you picked this up on your one page reflections, which some of you wrote two and three pages. I was very impressed. And I think definitive proof that nothing 
not definitive, but I think strong proof, right? That's nothing bad happened was the moment that Holden that I'm sorry, Mr. Antolini gives the Holden the advice that he gives him, which we'll talk about in, in a minute. It's very good advice. This mark of the immature man advice. Holden tells you, I still have the piece of paper in my wallet. So let me ask you guys a question, right? Remember that we talked about how the timeline of Catcher in the Rye. Holden's in a rest home and the entire novel is told in a flashback. So he's able to kind of tell you what happened, but then also tell you his current thinking of what has happened in the past, right? If someone sexually molests you or does something that's inappropriate to you, right? Would you keep something that person gave you in your wallet, which you carry around the whole time? Probably not, right? So that goes to show that probably Holden revisited in his mind what happened with Mr. Antolini, and he realized that maybe he reacted in a way that he shouldn't have. And that's why he still values this piece of advice that uh, Antolini gave him, which we'll get to in a second. Another thing that's very alarming about this scene, right? And a lot of you picked up on it, is if you head to the end of chapter 24, Holden says, right, as he's shooting out of Antolini's apartment, um, he mentions a couple of things. I have to go now. Anyway, I said, boy, was I nervous. I started putting on my damn pants in the dark. I can't hardly get them on. I was so damn nervous. I know more damn perverts at schools and all than anybody you've ever met. And they're always being perverty when I'm around. And then later on, he says, thanks a lot. I said, goodbye. The elevator was finally there. I got in and went down. Boy, I was shaking like a madman. I was sweating too. When something perverty like this happens, I start sweating like a bastard. That kind of stuff's happened to me about 20 times since I was a kid. I can't stand it. And now look at this huge reveal, right, that Holden has here at this moment. This is a boy who suffered from the death of a sibling, from terrible parenting, which becomes very apparent. His parents seem to just throw money at a problem. He's witnessed a suicide, right, right in front of him with a kid wearing his shirt. Um, and now look all of a sudden here, Holden hints at something much darker, something that he doesn't really go into, but he says that this stuff's happened to him before. Holden might have been in the past, right? a victim of some sort of sexual abuse at the hands of who we do not know, right? And if this novel really is based on Salinger's life, then maybe this is something that Salinger was hinting at. Then maybe this becomes a very personal testament, not only about a man's wartime experience and how it affected him, not only about a man's problems with society and the phoniness of adult world, but really, Maybe Salinger here in a very kind of rigid way, kind of constricted way, wanting to, you know, you have to remember something in the 1940s and 50s when the novel was written, people weren't open to talk about things the way they, this is a psychological novel at a time when psychology wasn't readily accepted by a lot of people. You know, this novel's done great things for psychoanalysis and therapy and, and things along those lines. And maybe this is Salinger in a very kind of dark, enigmatic way, try, perhaps revealing something horrible that happened to him when he was a kid. We don't know yet again, because Salinger never really revealed much. And that's the great mystery of the catcher in the rye, right? What prompted him to want to be, present this idea of wanting to be the catcher in the rye, right? Um, and in essence, you know, we'll talk a lot more about what, what catcher in the rye means, how we're all catchers in the rye in some sense. And we'll talk about that towards the end of the novel, right? Um, but at this moment, this might, you know, it's it, it hurts me. As much as I love this novel and as much as I've grown to appreciate J.D. Salinger as an author, this hurts a lot to know that maybe this is a novel written by a man that has suffered something so horrible in the past, right? And um, so, again, the beauty of literature is that it is uh, something to do with interpretation, right? It's all about, like, how you interpret it. There is no right or wrong, as is life. Literature is always a reflection of life in some ways. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, Mr. Antolini's advice now. Hopefully this clarifies whether Antolini was in fact in the wrong or not. Um, but I do think that Mr. Antolini does give Holden so much valuable advice here, right? Um, one of the things that he says, obviously the most um, well-known advice that he gives him here, Holden, 
Hol, uh, Mr. Antolini does in, um, share with Holden this idea that he feels, you know, and it continues the motif, that third motif that we discussed. We introduce motifs this this unit when we discuss novels, right? And we discussed the three motifs so far: the motif of games, which helps to develop the idea of conformity. We discuss the motif of things that are frozen, which helps to kind of develop the notion that Holden's stuck in place; he's not progressing. And then we have the third motif, which is falling, which is this idea that Holden is, in essence, falling. You know, falling appears in the catcher fantasy; it appears all throughout the novel, and this idea of of this great fall of this becoming less, of holding kind of falling apart, losing his innocence in some ways, right? And Mr. Antolini does acknowledge that he realizes that Holden is not doing well, right? This is a boy who's not eating. He's very eccentric. He's been acting very impulsive, which Mr. Antolini notices right away. Um, he sweats, he shakes, uh, he's smoking a lot, right? He's very nervous. And, and Antolini is concerned about him. He says at one point, he says, you know, you're heading for a fall a fall that that you don't even realize you're falling, right? And I think a lot of this is kind of touching upon like mental health, right? Another thing that I think was probably part of Salinger's agenda, mental health was not really spoken about much um, in the 1940s and 50s. Um, and Holden is depressed. You, he's getting more and more suicidal. He keeps talking about wanting to die, right? And I think um, Mr. Antolini very much recognizes this, right? And then look what he tells him. He says, I think one of these days, he said, you're going to have to find out where you want to go. And then you've got to start going there. But immediately, you can't afford to lose a minute. Not you, right? And, you know, a lot of literary critics have said that this is really Mr. Antolini is not really Mr. Antolini. It's really Salinger speaking to his audience. And he's imparting some very good advice here, right? Um, some of you have woken up already in life. Some of you realize we don't have a moment to lose. You're working hard towards something that you want to accomplish, whether it's a college degree, whether it's a a, a hobby, an interest, guitar, music, whatever it can be. But there, there's a fire under you and you're going, you're heading there, right? And I think what Mr. Antolini is trying to impart to Holden here is that some people wake up later in life and they miss out on a lot, you know? Some people wake up at 22, 23, 24, and they go, damn, I didn't do what I needed to do. And the sooner you wake up, the better, the more likely you are to accomplish something. And basically what Holden's, what Mr. Antolini is telling Holden here is that, you know, you can't hold on to everything. Look at his name again that we discussed last week, Holden, right? You got to move forward. You got to ask yourself what you want in life and how you're going to get there, right? And you need to move, right? You got to stop being stagnant still. You're no longer frozen. You got to have, um, move forward. And I think that's some of the best advice that Holden gets. And then, of course... Um, let's read the last advice, which I thought I had a slide for, but apparently it didn't save properly, right? Let's see. It is on page, for me, it's page 188, but he says to him, I don't want to scare you, he said, but I can very clearly see you dying nobly one way or another for some highly unworthy cause. If I write something down for you, will you read it carefully and keep it? Yeah, sure, I said. I did, too. I still have the paper he gave me. I went over to this desk on the other side of the room and, without sitting down, wrote something on a piece of paper. Then he came back and sat down with the paper in his hand. Oddly enough, this wasn't written by a practicing poet, he says. It was written by a psychologist named William Steckel. And this is about the fourth or fifth time that psychology and psychoanalysis has shown up in the novel, which makes it clear that that's the lens, that's the literary theory that you need to apply to Catcher in the Rye. Here's what he said. The mark of the immature man is that he wants to die nobly for a cause, while the mark of the mature man is that he wants to live humbly for one, right? And I think, you know, we, we could talk for hours about that advice. It's very um, interesting one. But I think what, it, what, what Mr. Antolini is trying to present to Holden is the idea that one of the beautiful things about youth, about adolescence, about your age group, one of the things that I admire so much about my students is your passion. You know, a lot of adults, unfortunately, sometimes recognize that passion as immaturity or they recognize that passion as misguided. But one of the beautiful things I think about coming of age and being an adolescent and being a teenager really is how strongly you feel about things. You know, you see injustice. And you want to run in there and save you um you see a wrong and you want to fix it right um and i think one of the dangerous things about becoming older is that you 
become complacent. You conform to all the bad in the world. You see the things that are wrong, and instead of them bothering you like they did when you were a teenager and adolescent, you kind of just say, ah, that's the way things are, right? And that's wrong. I think that a, a lot of us can, or a lot of adults can learn a lot from the passions of adolescence, right? That doesn't mean that sometimes you're not immature or you can't uh, act a fool <laughs> like I tell my daughter sometimes, right? But the idea is that you're passionate about things. You want to change the world, right? But look what Mr. Antolini tells him, right? You want to live for the change. You don't want to run in there and be the catcher in the rye and try to do something that you will never be able to accomplish. That change is something that happens slowly over the course of a lifetime. That if Holden sacrifices himself, if he commits suicide, if he does something that he shouldn't, uh, that isn't towards a long-term change goal, that everything will have been for naught, a sacrifice for nothing, right? Um, I think in the passionate impulses of youth, this can sometimes be the temptation, right? I'm going to run in there and I'm going to save the world. And then sometimes this can lead to more hardship or personal harm, right? And look what Mr. Antolini says, that, that the things you want to help have to be done slowly. And they have to be done maturely, right? Um, so that's, I think, how you can kind of take Mr. Antolini's advice. And then one of the things that to me is one of the more beautiful moments, right, in The Catcher in the Rye, is when Mr. Antolini shares with Holden the beauty of literature, right? And he tells him, among other things, you'll find that you're not the first person who was ever confused and frightened and even sickened by human behavior. You're by no means alone on that score. You'll be excited and stimulated to know many, many men have been just as troubled morally and spiritually as you are right now. Happily, some of them kept records of their troubles. You'll learn from them if you want to, just as someday, if you have something to offer, someone will learn something from you. It's a beautiful reciprocal arrangement, and it is an education. It's history, it's poetry, right? And to me, that encapsulates why I love literature and why I think that so many of you love literature without even realizing, right? A lot of you might love to read some of you might hate reading but literature remember comes in many forms in the form of song lyrics poetry uh film narrative visual media right and i think one of the most comforting things about for me reading specifically or watching film and listening to music is that if any of you have ever felt this and the majority if not all of you have you listen to song lyrics or you read a novel and you're like wow I thought that I was alone in how I felt. And then you start to realize that someone else is able to put into words a feeling or an emotion that you've had. And all of a sudden that creates this profound connection, right? And ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to impart to you a lesson. That's a connection that you have to find on your own, right? Um, English teachers, history teachers, your professors are going to want to try to teach you things. And a lot of them will teach you great things that you're going to take with you moving forward. But you have to venture out on your own. You can't just read what's mandated to you to read. Find those authors, find those voices, find those singers, those songwriters that speak to you. That is food for your soul. Remember that. And it's going to touch you deeply and it's going to allow you to be able to be well prepared for the moments in life where you're going to need to feel like you're not alone, okay? And I think that's what's great about Mr. Antolini and his advice and why I don't like to look at him in a negative way and instead like to interpret this scene as Salinger imparting to us this beautiful advice about priorities, maturity, change, and most importantly, the beauty of literature, all right? Um, I wish you guys... Uh, that you're all safe and healthy. I'm going to cut this short once again, man. Every time I talk, it's like verbal diarrhea. I can talk about Catcher in the Rye forever. Hopefully when we see each other next week during our Zoom meeting, if any of you have any questions, we can kind of touch base. All right. I've, I've included five discussion questions based on the literature and, um, well, oh, but not based on the literature, sorry, based on the lecture. All right. See you guys soon.